Amen. Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Welcome to those that are worshiping with us online. Call your attention to the announcements in the bulletin. A couple I would lift up. We continue to collect mittens and gloves and things of that nature on the Christmas tree in the narthex for our December monthly mission. Next Sunday at the 1030 service will be our Christmas program. 815 service will be as normal at, in the uh, fellowship hall. If you would like to provide a poinsettia for the Christmas Eve, that needs to be here by the 20th of December, please, and let the church office know if that's in memory or in honor of someone. And of course, Christmas Eve service will be here at 5 o'clock on Saturday the 24th. And then Christmas morning, uh, we're going to have one service of worship at 9 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and that will happen again on the following Sunday, which is New Year's Day, one service at 9 o'clock. So let us uh, take a moment and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning. You all would like to join me in the call to worship? The earth anticipates God's love, born in a village called Bethlehem. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The love born in a village called the city of David is the love that greets us now. And join together in our opening hymn, Lo, How a Rose Ever Blooming. Join me in the opening prayer. Holy God, your prophets have long spoken of the one who would come to save us. Now the promise is fulfilled. Now your kingdom has come near. Send us as messengers of your way to go and tell all the world of the wonders we have seen and the good news we have heard. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The 
The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. A highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. And the ran ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The prophet Isaiah tells us above the joy of ascending to God's house. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then he tells us that the journey to get there is just as much as joy. The psalmist says, happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith, who executes justice, gives food, sets prisoners free, opens eyes, lifts up, watches over, upholds, the Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. We light these candles, the candles of amazing love, the candle of joyous hope, and the candle of deep and everlasting joy as a sign that we are those who walk with a skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy. We are ascending to God's promise. kids would like to come up and pass the bucket this month we're collecting for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital.
anybody else would like to come down for children's time, you can do that now. Okay, I have some questions today, and then we're going to talk a little bit about something that we don't always talk about around Christmas time. So, today I'm going to pick on Colt, okay? So, we always talk, and there's always these three people that come from very far away to visit Jesus. Do you know what they're called? The what? The three wise men. That is right. Okay, good job. So, does anybody know, raise your hand. If there's another name we call the three wise men, the kings, anything else? Do you know what they actually were? They were called magi. Okay. Now, way back when Jesus was born, they, magi were, it's kind of a, it was a type of a priest, which is like a type of a pastor. And they study certain things. And do you know what these types of priests studied? stars. They were astrologists, not astronomers, astrologists. So back then they really thought astrology was a, was a science. And astrology is like, um, like if I was born in May, so I'm a Taurus and some people are Leos or Capricorn. See Capricorn, there you go. So it's kind of they believe that all these things happen because of the placement of the stars in the sky. And so they were really thought like they were really good like types of scientists. And they followed the star in the sky that is now called the Star of Bethlehem to where Jesus was born. Now, how long do you think they had to follow the star in the sky? A long time. How many days do you think they walked? Three days? More than three. Not a thousand. Good effort. More than five. More than ten. Twelve. That's the estimate. There's a lot of people thinking they, they walked twelve days through a desert. Does anybody know what a desert is like? Tell me one word that describes a desert. Hot. What is it? Sandy? It is sandy. What else? Barren. There's nothing there. There's sand and sand dunes and maybe some camel tracks. No water. You're right. What else, Philip? It's very dangerous. So it's hot and sandy. And raise your hand if they think they, they had anything like Google Maps or MapQuest. Do you think they were like looking at their phone like when your moms and dads drive to a new place? right? Like we're watching our phone and what does our phone tell us to do? It says, turn right in 300 feet, right? But they didn't have any of that. You know what they had? Nothing. One star in the sky during the night. And that's the only way that it could teach them, tell them where to go. Okay. It does kind of remind everyone of Moana. So, So when we talk about the three wise men and when they're coming, one of the things that we have to remember is they weren't really kings. They weren't these really, really, really smart guys that knew everything. But they were a type of a priest or a special type of pastor that studied the stars. And they had been told and it kind of prophesied to them that this star would lead them to the new king. And that new king was Jesus. So the next time, does anybody know what day it is today? December what? 11th. Good job, Colton. Okay, 11th. So think about on Tuesday, December 13th, that would be the start of your walk all the way to Christmas. Okay, and that's a pretty long time to be walking. So during that time, we have to think about how our hearts are focused on Jesus. Just like the wise men were focused on the star, our hearts need to be focused on Jesus. And I know it's really easy to focus on those presents under the tree, isn't it? Raise your hand if you already have presents under the tree. Not for me. I don't, we do not have any presents under our tree yet. I hope they're, I hope they're coming soon. So, yeah. Okay, so let's pray. Dear Lord, as we get so excited for this Christmas season and all the fun things it brings, 
Help us to keep our hearts and our eyes focused on the true meaning, the birth of baby Jesus and all that means for us. It can be hard because we're really excited for presents and we have lots of cookies and candies and fun things to do. But help us keep our hearts full of love and joy as we anticipate the birth of our Savior. In your son's name, amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning is taken from the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? 
someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Here ends the reading of the word. May God bless its reading and our hearing it. And if you're comfortably able to do so, please stand as we sing together number 626, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. Please be seated. Well, have you ever had that experience where you didn't understand something or you wanted to ask a question but you were afraid to ask it because you were afraid everybody was going to think you didn't know what was going on? I remember that happened a lot in geometry class and also in chemistry class, which is why I went into ministry. But that is another story for another day. But sometimes you're sitting there and you're like, you know you don't understand what's going on, but you're just too afraid to ask the question because you don't want people to think that you're just not quite up to par with everybody else. And then finally, the smartest kid in the class raises their hand and you think, oh, thanks be to God. If they don't know the answer, then that means nobody knows the answer, so it's okay to ask the question, right? Huge sigh of relief, yes? Well, John the Baptist is the smartest kid in the class. And he is asking the question that is on everybody's mind in this passage this morning. He wants to know, are you the guy we've been waiting for or not? And it's really weird that it's John the Baptist asking because of anybody, he should have known that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, think about this for just a moment. Mary, when she was pregnant with Jesus, went to visit her relative Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John. You remember that story? And when she got there, John leapt, or leaped, leapt, somebody help me out, leaped, leapt, jumped, thank you. (laughs) 
jumped in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth said, How is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So even before they were born, John the Baptist knew that Jesus was the Messiah, right? Now they being relatives, they didn't live next door to each other. They lived several miles apart, but they had to have family reunions, yes? Mary did not grow up next door to Elizabeth, but yet we're told that she was close with Elizabeth. And so she traveled a long ways to go visit Elizabeth. So it's safe to assume that John and Jesus grew up together. Got into a little mischief together, I would like to believe, you know. I don't, I don't know what they would have done. I don't know what was the deal. They didn't dip anybody's, you know, ponytails in ink wells or anything like that. But they had, you know, I'm sure they got into trouble as extended cousins might often do. And then all of a sudden we have John wondering, are you the Messiah or are we waiting for somebody else? And it's comforting for us, it's comforting to me at least, to know that somebody with the faith of John the Baptist would still wonder if this is really all true. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? Thank you. All right. If he hadn't said that, we couldn't go on, you know. Now, sometimes when you ask questions, it makes it sound like you're doubting, right? And especially questions of faith. And you don't want people to think that your faith is on tenuous footing. We want people to think that we're the strongest and have the most amount of faith in the world. Look at me, a pillar of strength and faith. But if we ask questions and it sounds like we're doubting, people are going to think that we aren't all that faithful. That's the problem that we have. We begin to wonder, is Jesus really the Messiah or do the Jewish folks understand more than we do, right? Did he really get born in a mate? Was he really laid in a trough? You know, was Mary, the Holy Spirit, I mean, is that really the way it happened? You know, these things just come to mind from time to time. And on one hand, we might feel guilty for thinking them. But on the other hand, we have John the Baptist, a man of great faith, who knew who Jesus was, who still came to doubt and wonder if all this was really true. But sometimes we wonder, is there anything to religion? Is there anything to the church? Is it just a nice story? Or is it really, totally, ultimately true? And when things are going well, it's easy for us to believe it all. And when things are going poorly, then we think, maybe, maybe this, isn't, this isn't all entirely accurate. And so we're left kind of in limbo, somewhere in the middle. And these questions can be dangerous. They can make implications about the person who's asking the questions. They imply weakness. They imply doubt. And to ask these questions is to appear faithless. But here... We have John the Baptist asking these questions as the smartest kid in the class. And this comes after he has already made more than one declaration about the lordship of Jesus. In the third chapter, he says, There is one who is more powerful than I am following me, and I'm not worthy even to untie his sandals. You remember that verse, yes? In the Gospel of John, he says, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the third chapter of John, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Those sound pretty affirmative uh, statements of John's belief in the Messiahship or the Lordship of Jesus. So what changed? What do you suppose caused John to begin to have these doubts? Well, I would suggest that it could be that going to prison could put doubts into anybody's heart. And that is where John found himself when he asked these questions. He asked other, he goes, go and ask these of Jesus for me. And I would have to imagine, if I were thrown in prison, I would have a few doubts as well. I would be scared out of my mind. I remember seeing, there was a movie many years ago with Tom Selleck. I can't think of the name of it right now. The Alibi? I don't remember. He was framed for doing bad things, and he went to prison, and he really was innocent. And I remember thinking how easy it looked to frame somebody else, and by gosh, I hope that never happens to me. 
and then several years later, there was, if anybody familiar with the British show, the, the, the uh, uh-huh, the It Crowd, the IT Crowd, I cannot believe that the two of you don't know that show. Okay, well, you were aware of it? Okay, okay. Well, there's this guy in the show, his name is Moss, and he's kind of a dweeb, he's kind of a nerd, and they're talking about prison, and he goes, I would not flourish in a prison environment. That is exactly how I feel. I would not flourish in a prison environment, and I know I would be filled with questions and with doubts, as John the Baptist was while he was in prison. Now, Jesus' actions up to this point were not the actions of what many believed the Messiah would do. If you remember, they were expecting this great warrior king going to turn Rome on its ear, overthrow the government, all of these great military and political things. And that is not how Jesus rolled, was it? And so he began wondering, well, maybe this isn't the guy. He'd heard the stories about all these things that Jesus was doing, and that didn't sound like what they were entirely expecting. And that is comforting, I think, at least to me, hopefully to you, that someone with John's faith would still begin to wonder, Is he really who he says he is? Is he really the one that we're waiting for? And Jesus' response, in the most perfect of political responses, says, decide for yourself. He doesn't answer the question. He doesn't come right out and say it, as often he doesn't. He says, you got to decide for yourself. And he says the same thing for us. Because it's a decision that we have to make, whether or not, Jesus is Lord of our lives. And then we're invited to look at what evidence we might have. We look throughout our lives and we can see places where the lordship of Jesus seemed a lot more prominent and perhaps a lot more tangible than in other places. What experiences have we had that led us to believe that Jesus is Lord, is the Messiah? Now for some people, it's enough to know that others believe. Right? If you think about the greatest theological minds that the world has ever known, you think of St. Augustine and Martin Luther and John Wesley and Martin Luther King Jr. Well, if they believed it, there's got to be something to it, right? I mean, people have believed this for 2,000 years. There's got to be something to the story. But then you think about maybe people that you've known personally, people who have been pillars of faith, pillars of strength, who have encouraged you and guided you and just by their own example of faith have helped you to believe that faith is an important factor, that there must be something to this, that even perhaps we don't understand, we can't quite grasp, but, you know, I remember Mrs. Brainerd from my church when I was a little kid, I remember, I don't remember ever having a conversation with her about faith, but she was about 312 years old, and she was at church every Sunday, and I remember thinking, well, if Mrs. Brainerd believes it, it must be okay, because Mrs. Brainerd wouldn't lie, right? Have you ever known anybody like that, just by their example, you know? Now, that's kind of the relationship that Mary had with Elizabeth as well. When Mary found out she was pregnant, she was told that Elizabeth was pregnant, so she went to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was, for Mary, that kind of a a mentor, a spiritual guide, someone who encouraged her, who helped strengthen her own faith. And perhaps each one of us have an Elizabeth in our lives. Perhaps each one one of us can relate to Mary, who may be a little scared at what the future holds. We're not told that Mary doubted anything, She wanted to know how things were going to happen, but she didn't doubt the grace of God, but she had to still be scared. I cannot imagine being a 13 or 14-year-old girl engaged to one guy and told that you're going to have a baby that's not his. That was not looked favorably upon in those days. But she goes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth gives her strength and courage. And then I begin to wonder, who are we and Elizabeth for? Who are we setting that example for? Who is looking at us and our faith to get strength when they have their own doubts? When we have our own doubts, who do we turn to? Who do we talk to? Who do we lean on? We think about those people that have gone before us, these great minds. We think about the people that we do know. We think about our own experiences. And ultimately, it is our own 
decision whether or not we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And there will be times when we wonder if that's really true. And that's when we can turn back to this passage and take strength in the faith of John, knowing that if John the Baptist had a doubt, it's probably okay that we have a doubt from time to time as well. Because you know what? God already knows that we are going to doubt from time to time. And God does not kick us to the curb when we have a question, when we have a doubt, when we are worried, when we're wondering if it's all true or not. God loves us in the midst of that. God picks us up. God brushes us off. God puts an Elizabeth in our lives to help us be strengthened and lean on their faith when our faith isn't strong enough to lean on by itself. Now, an interesting tidbit that I came upon this week in looking at this passage is that part of the passage where Jesus, Jesus asks his followers, what did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? Well, the Greek word that is used for reed uh, referenced a, a reed that grew only in Egypt from which writing utensils were made. But the evangelists in writing the Gospels were no doubt referring to a tall and graceful plant called the Arundo Donax. Is anybody familiar with the Arundo Donax? Well, apparently, it grows abundantly and quite luxuriously along the banks of many streams in the Jordan Valley. The tops, the tops are big and fuzzy and light and feathery, and they, they, are, they are brushed around by the slightest of breezes. But the stems are strong and straight, and even scripture tells us that they were used as walking sticks and also as measuring rods, as well as other useful items. So it's been suggested that when Jesus refers to these reeds, did you come out to see a reed blowing in the wind, he may have been using that as a metaphor for John because of John's unbending convictions that he was just as resilient and flexible as that grass. But even John might bend with the breeze, but he did not break. And that is the doubts that we encounter in this world. They might blow us back and forth, to and fro, and that is okay as long as we don't snap and give up because that is not what God calls us to do. We think about the experience of others. We think about our own experiences. We can think about Jesus being in our lives in those deepest, most meaningful moments of life, whether it's you know, at marriage or the birth of a child, the birth of a grandchild. Perhaps it's the loss of a loved one. For everybody, it's going to be something different. Those deep moments are rooted in Christ because Christ is in all of our moments if we are willing to let him be. And as we journey through this season of Advent, we look forward to Christmas and inviting him to be reborn within the manger of our hearts. And we go forward with a new and renewed knowledge and feeling of Christ living within us. But you know what? The day after Christmas and the day after that and the day after that, that feeling sometimes tends to fade just a little bit. The newness kind of wears off. When about the time we're taking down the tree and we're putting the nativity set away for another year, it's easy to forget that feeling that we felt on Christmas. And things don't always go the way we planned. Things don't always go the way we hoped. And those questions and those fears and those doubts may settle in once again. But let us remember that if doubting was okay for John the Baptist, doubting is okay for us as well. We can bend, but we cannot snap. And if we feel like we are about to, we must look for an Elizabeth to lean on while our own faith is being strengthened. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to go to God in prayer.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created this wondrous world from nothing, and you've placed us in it for your pleasure. You've shown us that an even more beautiful place, a holy way, has been prepared for us. Your grace is so bountiful, yet too often we are blind to it in our midst. Your promises are true, and yet we have our ears closed and do not hear you speak them. Our tongues remain silent from witnessing your abundant mercy. We think of ourselves as being lowly, but at times only for the sake of others calling us blessed. We sometimes are proud in the imagination of our hearts and need to be cast down. O oh God, remember your mercy to us who seek to love you and help us to amend our lives. Send the power of your Holy Spirit to unstop our tongues, unplug our ears, and strengthen our feeble knees that we might teach and proclaim your message throughout the world. Give us patience to await your coming and keep us steadfast in faith until all your promises are fulfilled. Be with those this day who wait with us, but wait in hospitals and care centers, in places of healing and in the midst of grief. Here and now, we ask your presence to be with the family of Mary Jean Bailey, the family of Adam Allmeyer, with Tom Horty, Jerry and Tina Lowenstein, Donna Best and family, Bob Grosser, and the people of Ukraine. Bless those whose names we have lifted up to you and those whom we ponder only in our hearts that all of them may know the power of your presence. Hear our prayers this day, O God, and answer us in this life and in the life to come. For we pray in the name of him who has come to show us the way and is coming again to take us to your presence, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. song, the Lord is my praise, all my hope comes from God. The Lord is my song, the Lord is my praise, God the wellspring of life. As a farmer plants the seeds and waits for the rains to come, let us entrust our gifts to the Lord as we await the coming of God's rain.
join me in our prayer of dedication. Generous God, you have given us all that we have and all that we are. We thank you for the opportunity to respond to your love and generosity by sharing our gifts with others. Our hearts sing with joy as we work with you to bring true peace and justice to our world. As we prepare for the coming of your Son, may our lives proclaim your good news for all throughout the earth. Amen. And now please join together in our closing hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Go now into the world with a strong faith, but when you question and even doubt, be mindful that there are others upon whom you can lean. It's okay to bend, just don't break. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.